No, and thank you for making time to be here. Something that I want to share with you is whether you realize it or not, I don't think I've shared this with you before, but uh, as I was growing up in the being a little toddler in the Air Force photography world, and I was starting to be introduced to a lot of my mentors, they grew to be mentors like Benny Davis and JT Locke, uh, Andy Dunaway, and um, I started getting exposed to incredible visuals and incredible storytelling. Uh, and this was all probably around um, 2009, 10, 11. And it's when I got to San Antonio uh, from Alaska. And um, some of the first incredible storytelling and visuals I ever saw that still resonate with me today is your work that you did with Fort Sam. Um, and then I think there was, and I forget the name, I apologize, but the story uh, with the, the individual, with he was very big um mm -hmm. that done with obesity and that family and the, the level of storytelling and commitment uh that an investment i think psychologically physically everything to put in to capture those things um really resonated with me and it definitely helped set a bar and create clarity on a goal a north star uh for me to try to attain and definitely i think i fell short 100 but you helped identify for me um visually what a path forward should look like and that's something to aspire to so i want to thank you for that uh and again it's really cool to actually be able to share that with you now and again have you here oh well, thank you very much yeah and so with all that um, I like to learn a little bit more about stuff I don't know yet. And so first question is, um, do you have any first memories and with photography, whether it's family stuff or teenage years, but do you have those first impressions that have stuck with you? Yes. So I first want, I, there were cameras in my house, apparently, because there's actually this little, I think it's an icon on my Google ID or something it's like me holding a little tiny play like toy camera yeah yeah a little picture I have no idea where that came from but um so I I think it was around me somehow and I was always a newspaper reader although I hadn't thought about the photographs at all um but when I was about 10 I my Girl Scout troop was going across country to a um, with two cars of girls going oh, wow. to yeah. a Girl Scout camp in Wyoming. Um, and I always felt like I had a bad memory. This is probably before the Girl Scout trip, but I always felt like I had a bad memory. So I wanted a camera so I could remember things. And so I pulled like every bit of money I had from anything from, um, you know, any kind of Christmas or birthday. And I got a Kodak disc camera. Wow. To to my um on my girl scout trip and yeah, really so, cool. so i photograph i documented our girl scout trip i think it was like i think i was about 10 and um so yeah so i just always wanted a camera and i don't even really know why except for the memory thing which is still i don't have the best memory but um and then even in my, like, in, there's this really funny photo album that I found that I put together in middle school. So I would actually, apparently, I don't really remember this, take my camera to middle <laughs> school, which was probably still like a <laughs> disc. And um, it might have been evolved to like a slightly better point and shoot. Um, and then I had a photo album with where I'd actually written captions. So it's like so and so. Wow. Like, experiment in chemistry. I have no idea like how this even happened. I don't remember doing it. And um, so, yeah, I just always wanted a camera and always wanted to do it more as a memory keeper, more yeah. as being sentimental. That's incredible to have the forethought to want to capture memories in the two and then give it context, you know, and write captions or write those little quotations. And was, the, was there anyone in your family that was like the family photographer or was it just like a shared duty? Is Was there any kind of influence with that or it all just sort of stemmed you know, from your, your will uh, and your imagination? It, I think it was around me, but I really don't remember. <laughs> I almost, like, again, it's my yeah, memory. Yeah. Um, there is a photograph of my, uh, my grandfather holding a camera that I have in a frame with a bunch of family photos and my, mm -hmm. um, my great uncle with a camera. And so I know 
they all had cameras and yeah. so they would come to florida they were in new york um where you know they were born and raised and they would come down to florida and take a lot of photographs but i don't there wasn't any like distinctive thing that there was no photographer in my family i just i don't know i just latched onto it somehow yeah that's really cool and so like as you were growing up and uh, shooting those things in school, was there like any kind of like yearbook club or was there anything like you did with that? Um, and if not, um, like what was your path forward and your passion with photography? Well, going in high school, there was, I did want to do yearbook or newspaper, but I didn't really have a way to like transportation to get like yeah. stay friends after Child school problems, and then yeah. <laughs> I was a school bus rider or a hitch a ride with friends rider and then I started working at the grocery store when I was 16 mm -hmm. like the day after I turned 16 and then I just worked and didn't do that yeah. much I, did, I remember looking into it and wanting to do it um but it just didn't work out schedule wise and then um so fast forward to I guess you're saying where where I started moving in this direction. Yeah. So you, so that's interesting to me. You got to the point to where like, it's going to happen with my family. Like our daughter is going to event like start uh, getting a part-time job and then growing through that phase to where maybe some of her hobbies now are going to potentially die off or be put to the side because she's going to start growing, you know, into her teenage years. And so like for you, like you started to focus, we're going to have a grocery store and life happens. And how do you navigate to the point again, where you find you know, your passion uh, for picking up the camera and really uh, start starting on your path to create the incredible work that you've done? Well, it happened a little later than for some people. So again, I did not start in high school because I didn't work out because um, I wanted three. I wanted a car. I wanted money. And mm -hmm. freedom, and that hasn't changed for decades and decades. <laughs> Those all worked together. So it was like that was the path. And so then um, I you know, grew up in Tallahassee, Florida. So um, there was a university there that my dad taught at actually Florida State University. And so I went there having no clue what I wanted to do with my life, um, started um, working on a psychology degree, which is one of what I wound up graduating with. But the first um, summer after my freshman year, I saw a flyer for a job for a, at a graduation photography company. And so, you know, when you walk across the stage and shake the principal's hand and then mm -hmm. used to send a little proof, a photographic proof, you know, in the mail to people. Now I'm sure it goes by email. But um, so I got a job in that office purely because it was, you know, a great summer job. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then just, but the photographers that were making the photographs were roaming around Florida, going from graduation to graduation. And they had to leave us a little thing on a tape recorder saying, this is so-and-so we're at this graduation. And they would say, this is so-and-so we're at Miami beach high school graduation. We're staying on the beach tonight. And I thought, that sounds way more fun than being in an office <laughs> sweating <laughs> photographs. Yeah. Like, okay, so how do I be a photographer for this company? And so then I applied to be a photographer for the company. To work there, you had to have a, a Nikon FM2. And so, but they paid for half of it. And then I paid for half of it, but it came out gradually out of my paycheck. But then I got to keep the camera. Wow. So had an FM2. Nikon. That's Wanted awesome. To figure out how to use it. And so took, um, there's no journalism program at Florida State. So I went to their fine art school and took a intro to black and white photography class. Um, typical, you know, story of fell in love the moment I saw the photograph come up in the developer mm -hmm. yeah. and then spent that like the next year in the dark room. But, um, but it was an art program and I am not a you know, painter, sculptor, none of that. So I just stayed with my psychology degree and, but just, you know, kept playing with the FM2 and trying to um, get better. And then people in my class were doing more, much more art. So like, I don't know if it's art, but like, I remember one project was on mutilated dolls and one project <laughs> on, um, <laughs> with bathroom stalls or something in bathrooms. Yeah. I was really deep. People. 
I was photographing, you know, my family or going to the county fair and roaming around mm -hmm. and the people in my class were responding positively to it. So that encouraged me to keep going and then went to my psychology advisor's office and looked up the word photojournalism and there were three schools listed mm -hmm. um, and I will have to rewind here in a sec, but the three schools listed, they were RIT, University of Missouri and Syracuse. Oh yeah. I do all three only mm -hmm. got into Syracuse for their graduate program for photography and went there, but um, I should rewind a little bit. So what was also very influential was there is a um, Florida A&M University is in Tallahassee. It's an HBCU okay. and they have a journalism school. And I worked with a photographer who was in the photojournalism program there at the graduation company. And so he wound up telling me about photojournalism. I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. So that's how I wound up looking up the word. Yeah. <laughs> photojournalism, not really right. what it meant and going to Syracuse. That's a lot. That's a, that's a heck of a journey. And it makes me just like what you shared about like being in the dark room and having and, and developing a print. So interesting for me, like when I was in high school, we had a graphics class, but then we also had um, like a school, high school newspaper, and we actually had a printing press. And so like we had like probably I think the first version of Adobe, Adobe Photoshop, um, and so we would do meaningless stuff on there. It was almost that class a lot of people signed up for to like skate by. But for me, I think I was one of the two students who probably took it seriously and like I because I really enjoyed it. And part of the process is going into the dark room and developing um these pages and these designs to be put on these metal sheets of paper to be run through the press and to make all the papers. And um to me it was just magical and it was uh intimidating because it was like you like you had the stop the fixer the stop you had all these different things and I was like a fixer is a stopper is a what and again I'm just a high school kid and so fast forwarding a little bit um uh get join the air force um I find out I'm gonna be a photographer when I graduate because I'm not the the brightest guy and I didn't quite know um you know what that was gonna be but uh get to class and it they we end up finding out at least what is what they tell us who knows how truthful it is that we were the first all digital class um going through the defense information school which is a, a joint school for those who don't know uh with because we share uh same seats with navy marine corps army and then even some coast guard from time to time will go through there so we all fall fall under the same regulations and so there's a continuity for how like we're being ethical with our photos when and when taking these pictures of these different kinds of missions but it was interesting hearing that just the class before us they still actually had to um, take pictures with film cameras and and then develop them. And for us, it was just all digital, put a card in there. Um, and then if I think it's like a 512 megabyte card with 86 photos and a Nikon D1 something. And, uh, and uh, it's just, it's crazy to think about like the progression and how rapid it got, uh, like when technology got to the point where it could support it. Um, but that was really interesting to make that comparison and reflect back on in here. And so, and also to Syracuse um, and what, like you had those three options. Was there something particular that drew you to Syracuse out of, out of the, the minimal options that were in front of you? Um, well, they had, I can't remember if I, I probably called somehow they sent a letter with the information. It, I had a thing about how Bob Gilka Mm -hmm. you know, the legendary wow, yeah. Party. Yeah, yeah. Um, National Geographic was had taught a class there and also I did get the sense that they were accepting people that didn't have journalism or photography experience and which I didn't so I recognized early on that you know that might be my best option because Missouri seemed to want more of that and um, more of a journalism background and um, you know, even just, you know, high school journalism or, you know, working at the college newspaper. And then also RIT wanted more photography experience, I think, too. So Syracuse just seemed like it was going to be a good place. And of course, you know, the name. Mm -hmm. It's like, right. Yeah. Automatically, you you want to go there. 100%. And so for me, the Syracuse experience was interesting. It was a blast, um, a little bit different because like going there a little bit older, 
um, because of the special program that we have and that DOD um, incredible opportunity and loved it there. Um, what was your experience like going, especially going from Florida uh, all the way to upstate New York? Um, what was that like for you? Well, it was freezing, of course. I didn't even have a winter coat. I mm -hmm. did not have a winter coat. So um, I remember it was uh, already kind of chilly, but I loved it because to me, it was just such an adventure, the whole thing, um, you know, from the, you know, of course, new house is very impressive. It looked mm -hmm. very different then, but it was still like the main new house building. The campus is very impressive. I loved my professors and I was just, you know, there's, it's very different when you're, when you find what you love to do and you start doing it. And so that it was just like, uh, probably loved almost every second of it. I'm sure there were times where I had to write papers when not so much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, fun. yeah, it was such a different, um, you know, it's such a different area, but I really loved Syracuse and it was all just an adventure for me. 100%. And when so you, you, you out your path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, you're good. Um, and so you graduate or you complete your time at Syracuse. Um, and what happens next? Well, I wound up doing internships, but I should rewind a tiny little bit to how I figured out newspapers was on the first day of orientation. I was standing in line with um Doug Van Reith, who had come uh, from a newspaper in Alaska, actually, one of the papers had folded. And so the, the photographers all came to Syracuse kind of one after another to do the very early web design, building a website for wow. photography. And so he told me about working for a newspaper. And I thought, wait, you can get paid for that. I can get <laughs> to go to the county fair and roam around and take photographs and like learn about people's lives and be in their homes and learn about how to tell their stories. And so the minute I heard that, I was, that was just it. I'm like, I'm going to be a newspaper mm -hmm. photographer, no looking back. Um, and so then I applied for internships, probably applied to 30 internships, got one barely. Um, and then uh, what one I got because it was at the Syracuse newspapers and I had gone down and met the director of photography, Harry mm -hmm. Dior, um, who some people may know. Um, and so just did internship, did that first internship that summer at the Syracuse newspapers, then worked for them in the fall still when I was finishing up my, you know, my third semester is only three semesters. I did it in three semesters or so. Then went to the Albuquerque Journal to intern and then I went to the Indianapolis Star to intern that summer with Chip Mowry, who oh wow yeah, yeah that's a name drop <laughs> hired hired me for the um for the internship and then I got the job at the Naples Daily News went there for five and a half years and then came to San Antonio so, so. first yeah if for those who don't know Chip Mowry he is one of the first if not the first a photographer that covered the Navy SEALs before they were called Navy SEALs. Um, I think the Frogmen uh, were their names. Um, it, he's a pop pop, you know, one of the most jolly. I don't know how he was back in the day, but the version of Chip, you know, that I got um, very jolly, big, happy guy. Um, but to um, do be a part of such incredible rich history, you'd never know being such a humble humble human being that he just loves and thrives off of mentoring and giving back uh, and his little duckies, you know, shooting things, making the duckies go quack, quack. And so I know uh, I definitely need to sit down with him soon and catch up, but thank you for that. So you jump around uh, from paper to paper. And so what was different about San Antonio to where, uh, like, I feel like you've planted roots essentially. Yeah, well, sin. I mean, for the Express News, I went there because um, a friend who I had met in Florida, Nicole Frege, who uh, now is the, I don't know her exact title, but she's the head of visuals at the San Francisco Chronicle. And um, she was a photographer at the Sarasota paper and then went to San Antonio. And so when there was an opening, she told me about it. So I went there and I went there because there was a big emphasis on long-term projects and there was a big emphasis on 
um, giving people t time to work on those because they valued them so much. And because it was a bigger staff than Naples, you could have people working on different projects. And then, you know, someone was doing sports and someone was doing news and then someone was working on a project. So, and they were also traveling a lot at the time. They were really ambitious for their size. And, um, you know, that's when everyone had money. And mm -hmm. right, so yeah. we were traveling a lot. So I got to do a lot of really awesome stuff. And of course, work with Nicole, which was wonderful. So, um, and then I don't know, I just really loved San Antonio and I had such a good situation here. And eventually like I got, um, admittedly when I did have a couple opportunities to leave. They, my boss at the time, Luis Rios, who was the director of photography, he had, he had come, uh, he, I didn't have him the whole time. I had different, there were different directors of photography, but when he came, he valued the long-term storytelling above all. So of course, and that's what I love. So I had the opportunity to do that much more and he's an incredible editor. So I wanted to stay with him as my editor and um, so, yeah, and then he, they gave me a project photographer position there for about five years. Wow. Oh, so, yeah. So I got to really, you know, pitch stories constantly, um, you know, start talk with reporters and we would start on stories together. So I had mm -hmm. a ton of autonomy and just freedom to find stories that I wanted to work on and then was given time to work on them, which is I think a lot of people's dream certainly right. is still my dream. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there goes Zeke running by. Um, and so for you, like your storytelling to me is still one of the best, if not the best for me personally, again, uh, that I draw inspiration from. And then uh, having the opportunity to sit down with you again, I more recently went back and looked at them again. And I'm still like, and like in awe of some of the moments that you've captured and but for you, like, did, did who or if you have drawn inspiration from um, who was that uh, to where how you were, I guess, navigating when you were committing yourself to a long term story project? So like from early on? Yeah. So I'd say, yeah, initially at the beginning, when you first started uh, like working and doing these stories or not necessarily the, you know, the ones I'm referencing, but doing stories um like who who were your inspirations at the time that sort of helped you focus how you wanted to pursue the projects? Yeah, I think it was somehow, and it might have just happened at Syracuse, but it was somehow I just always felt like I wanted to have several photographs that told a story and didn't feel like that one picture, you know, I really wanted to like spend time with people and figure out how to tell the story of their life. And I feel like I kind of felt that way from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I always wanted to know people's stories way before I even went to Syracuse. I was always saying, what's your story? What's your story? <laughs> and, um, and so, but er very early on, so my second semester um, I went to the Northern Short Course, the MPPA Northern Short Course in West Point, New York. And actually, I didn't, it was very male dominated, the conference was at first when I first, and I thought, do I belong here? Like, what am I, what is, this was kind of my first entry into seeing the profession outside of Syracuse, actually. Mm -hmm. Do I belong here? And so one of the speakers that year was Carol Guzzi. And wow. so yeah. I saw Carol Guzzi's work and I was just, you know, entranced and wanted to, of course, do work anywhere near the the kind of stories that she was working on or um, the kind of, you know, intimacy that she was able to, you know, find in people's lives and how to tell their stories because you didn't think about Carol, it was just about the people and the photographs and their stories. And I just really loved her approach and the time that she spent. And, you know, Carol, if you know, Carol, you know, she spends a ton of time on, on stories, years and years and decades on stories. So she was probably like that first, you know, another light bulb, you know, there were many light bulb moments, but that was another one, like, that's it. That's yeah. what, you know, and of course I never became Carol Guzzi, but. Um, uh, yeah, I would say uh, you're right on par for like your work <laughs> is incredible. 
<laughs> oh, thank you. But that was the first. And there were other people that had done stories that were speaking that year. Um, Stephanie, I can't remember her last name, but she had been at Syracuse and she won a Pulitzer for the female circumcision mm-hmm. right after she was right after she graduated. I can't remember her last name. I'm sorry. But um, and she spoke. And so that was, you know, another kind of long term story on female circumcision. And then there was another person who had done a story, I think, on kids that worked in a um or kids that lived in a hotel, their families lived in hotels and it was really powerful work. And I just, it really started clicking then. And then I was in a class, this photo editing class taught by Bob Lynn, who is another um, legendary, uh, he was the AME of visuals at the Virginia pilot and he would fly up. We didn't know Bob Gilk anymore, but we had Bob Lynn who would fly in and he would paste all the fo- the stories from the Virginia pilot on the wall. And a lot of them were long-term stories and I was like, that's, and that's, that's what, what that's for me. That's for me. Yeah, yeah. It just connected in another way that, so I just started doing it. That's and really probably, cool. Yeah. Probably David Sutherland banging it into my head. <laughs> yeah. Stay, stay, yeah. Your stay. pictures suck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You suck. Um, <laughs> this no, is he's, not publishable. Uh, what a, yeah. What a, what a gem. Um, he, when I went through Syracuse, uh, it was like I actually had to go to his office. And so um, to uh, like uh, going there and again, having mentors like Benny Davis, uh, Lance Chung, um, just JT Locke. I know Stacy Pierce all a little bit, but a little bit of everyone to where essentially they're giving me all the tools that Syracuse helped guide them to help, you know, make good decisions and put it into practice to where they were great mentors and pass it along to me. So when I got there, um, there were still things I was learning, but it wasn't as steep as a learning curve for a lot of the other military students that didn't necessarily have the mentors like I had. And so my work, I think, was a little bit ahead of theirs just because of that fact. And and so when it came time in uh, Sutherland's class, he put the pictures up on the board and uh, like everyone would get five, 10, 15, like 15 minutes. And then he would go up to mine, like this probably like after two or three weeks. And then he was click, 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 click. All right, moving on. And I'm like, what the, and I'm like, really? And I was like, can I get some feedback? And I was like, I'm here. And uh, yeah, I mean, I did have, I think I was young and I had a little pride and ego, which it felt, you know, good. But after a while, I'm like, I, need to learn something. I need you to rip me down in front of everyone else. Just, I want to feel part of the team and I don't feel part of it if you don't insult me. And, uh, and so eventually I went to his office and then sat down with them and he shared with me, he's like, look, you're at a point, at least for my class and for what this class's purpose is, um, you're at a point to where you don't really need my feedback on these tech, like the basic techniques and fundamentals. Um, but a lot of the other class members do. So we need to give that time to them, you know, but if you ever want questions or concerns, you can come to my office and we can definitely chat it up, you know, and, and I can, you know, we can talk about things that way. And so it was just one of those, uh, you know, Sutherland experiences that at the day he was just like, he didn't care about my feelings in class. He was like, and we're moving on. We're not going to waste our time here. And it was so, um, but it, it was a teachable moment for me too as well. And it, it stayed with me to where when I have, like when we would teach at the DOD workshop or any other kind of experience I have to do something like that is to where like I will focus maybe a little bit more attention on those who need it instead of dispersing it evenly. Because again, it's like I'm not necessarily helping the person um, that might be a little bit further ahead and I can I can connect with them offline and, and provide help in different ways. Um and so I'm trying to remember my next uh, question. And I think, um, so yes, um, so you, you went to school for psychology and um, and you're finding yourself doing these projects. Uh, is there some connection with um, you would have into making, um, I guess, a connection with these stories and these individuals you were covering and, and using your experience and knowledge in that field? So I don't think it was necessarily the knowledge. It was more what I'm interested in, which is like people's emotions, people's behaviors, their interactions, their relationships. And that's really what photojournalism is about for me. It's not so much the photography. It's about 
Like, how do you? I'm sorry, I'm like, he's a Zeke coming in. I have to show him to you, and then he'll go away. Oh, oh my yeah. goodness! Hello, hello, Zeke. Oh, he's making it. <laughs> so That's now awesome. he did. After I pick him, he's gonna want to leave. And oh. yeah. That's awesome. See you later. I'm sorry. So no, no, it's just my general interest, I think, but not necessarily. I can't remember like anything specifically connected to what I was learning. It was just more like, this is what I'm interested in. And so I just did the same thing with photojournalism and wanting to have some sort of sense of purpose and contributing in some way, which I feel like photojournalism does. Mm -hmm. So it kind of fed that, you know, that part of what I wanted to do as well. So, and, you know, psychology, I wanted to work, you know, why I thought I would be someone that could work with people like in, you know, kind of dealing with their life issues. I have Mm -hmm. no idea. And now I realize that would have been a terrible job for me, but at the time, that's what I wanted to do. So so, connected. Yeah. And so for me, I have two questions and I'm f- trying to figure out what's the best way I want to ask, which one I want to ask first. And so I think uh, to not be selfish um, for what I want to learn um, specifically, I guess what for you, is there a specific story that you've covered um, throughout all the stories you've covered that really resonates and that means um, the most to you? Um that isn't necessarily like maybe the two or three that stand out to me to where I was like, I'd have, you, you probably get the same questions about these particular stories all the time. Is there a particular story? Yeah. Let me rephrase this. Um, is there a particular story that resonates and means a lot to you that doesn't necessarily come up as in much photo photo conversation? Um now yeah. I'm getting ahead of myself yeah if there's a story that's like m- really meaningful to me yeah, that is not yeah. One. so yeah so is yeah is there a story that's very meaningful to you that typically doesn't get brought up in a conversation about your work hmm well I mean I don't know that people it's really meaningful to me because of how, I mean, like you mentioned, like the high, I think the high school for, I mean, not for him, it's Sam Houston high school. And, um, and then of course, Hector and Rowan are the stories that usually people would ask me about. Um, trying to think back there is like in recent years, the last big story I worked on that I spent, you know, years on and still actually have worked on recently um, is the survivors of the um, mass shooting at the church, First Baptist Church of Southern Springs outside of San Antonio. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, the photographs, I don't, you know, think about that. I mean, the photographs are very meaningful to me because the relationships with the people that I photographed are very meaningful to me. And that was like an incredibly profound um, story to work on and people whose lives, Mm -hmm. sorry, I'm getting a phone call. Um, And for people whose lives to learn about and to immerse in that story was, you know, like something I hadn't necessarily done I mean there's just so much to like, mm-hmm. what I learned in that story and that is that story is what led me to where I am now and what I'm doing now and so that's a really important story to me and those people are very important to me so but that's not to say that anyone else is not yeah. as important because the, I mean that's like the best thing about this profession is when you know you ask a question like that, there's all these faces that just go through your mind and all these stories that go through your mind. And they're all so different, but they all have a lot of impact and they Uh all stay with you and then become like who you are, even as a person. 100%. And so with that, for me, what I am I've been curious all these years about and having the opportunity to have you on today and and ask the question is, um, what was the experience like for the 
the Fort Sam Houston story because uh, you covered uh, an incredible amount of storytelling, whether it was um, loss of life or celebrations or there's just like this huge like um, layer of storytelling that there was like traditional moments like going through a high schooler's life with going to a dance or hanging out with friends or doing the the football games on a Friday night. And then there was other um, unfortunate things that happen in, in these individuals lives that you're there for. Um, it, like how was it going through that process? And then how are you able to um come out on the other side psychologically like sound and healthy or in like or were you hmm. well that story was all consuming and partially because I mean I had almost complete access to a high school and the students um you know were just it was a very like lively school too. So there was always things happen. I mean, I guess every school is, but um, their school. Yeah, sorry, I'm not, you might have to edit yeah. this. Part. Yeah, um, you're fine. Yeah. yeah. So it was, you know, I actually didn't pitch that story. Or initially, Nicole wanted to do that story, Nicole Fruge. And, um, mm. and then, but it didn't, there was a different principal and then the school was threatened with closure. And so then there was like a real news angle to do the, the story because the community was just outraged that the store, the school would potentially be closed. And so there was a new principal and actually a reporter, the paper, I think kind of pitched it within itself. And I said, I would like to do that, which is almost never, I almost never ask for stories because I just feel like it's karma. Like you get what you get and you do it. But that story is like, mm, I think I want to ask for that. So I did. And, but I actually, probably because I was at the Eddie Adams workshop, um, <laughs> I was as a producer, I wasn't there for this meeting and the beginning meeting and the big, it was around October to establish mm -hmm. access yeah. and, and kind of build, start building that um, opening for the reporter and I to go into the school. And so just knowing, okay, I have nine months to spend in the school. Like how many people get almost complete access to a high school? Like I'm going to make every single moment count. And then um, then I was still doing daily assignments. So I did go and I didn't have Luis was not my boss at the time. So um, it was kind of a time of chaos at the paper, but I started going to the football games after, because I could go after um, I worked eight to five. So I do my daily assignments and then I would go after my assignments. So you can see how this starts to be like constant mm -hmm. trying to fit it all in and do the yeah. daily assignments. So, um, but, and then, so there was a one thing that I learned a lot of from the story, though, is also um, so the community was a community with, um, you know, like a higher the, some negative things happened in the community and they were used to having, you know, it was like a higher crime rate. So or um, the community was used to seeing journalists in their community when mm -hmm. something was negative. Yeah. And so immediately when I walked in the door, even though I had, um, you know, the commitment from the administration, I did not have the commitment from the students. And so I had to build trust with all the students because a lot of them felt like I was only going to show the negative at their school because that's what they were used to seeing journalists come into their community for. And so that's part of why I went to so many different things, because I went to every single thing I was invited to because they would say, Miss, are you coming to? you know, our play rehearsal tonight, are you coming to our, you know, academic competition? And I would say, of course I am. And so then I would cancel my plans and <laughs> not exercise, I'll skip my spin class or my run. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, you know, we're asking about being mentally healthy and physically, I would say physically, I was not that healthy because I skip, I like, again, nine months, I have, I can do anything for nine months mm -hmm. and I did the most of this nine months with the school. So I didn't do a lot of the other things that normally I would do to stay healthy. And I would say that would be, you know, if I have advice for <laughs> any students or any, 
young professional, any professionals, like take that time to take care of yourself during because you're actually a better photographer in the long run when you do do that, which I didn't. So going back, I probably would have tried to have a little more balance. But at the time I was like consumed and obsessed with photographing every single thing that I could that could possibly tell their story. So I was so how do you how do you answer? Oh no, that's incredible. That's incredible advice. And uh, I think it's important to share. Um and and because as much as we may think internally, I think it's important to hear it from other members within the industry itself is saying, hey, like, you know, it, the story is important, but you're also important too. And like you can't tell the story uh, to the best of your ability if you are not taking care of yourself. And so that's always going to be a message that whenever it gets brought up on here, definitely take the time uh, to give that a platform uh, to share with everybody. Um, and so with that story, do you feel like looking back on it since the last time you've looked at it, do you feel like you've uh, did justice to the time, the nine months and the students and the community there? Um, do you feel the same as when you completed it initially? I do. I do. And probably more so because the students were happy with it. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't get, you know, even though there was, you know, like one situation, a story about a girl who had stabbed her boyfriend. Um, and I followed that some, um, and a, a, students were related to them, um, you know, they, it wasn't seen as like me focusing on the negative. And that was really important for me that they felt that the photographs were, you know, accurate and truthful to their story as much as it can be from, you know, a complete outsider. Mm -hmm. So obviously I'm not a teenager. It's not my neighborhood. It's, um, you know, definitely probably more that I was their mom's age. So, <laughs> so I, but, you know, sometimes that could be a good thing. So, yeah. And so for the other story, um, for the, the church, the shooting, uh, you talked about, um, it brought you down, uh, a different, a new path. Um, can you share, uh, what that path is and what it's developed into? Yes. So, that and I will say about that story is actually very similar to the high school story in that they did not trust journalists. And so very early on, they the community had it was a so I'll tell a little bit about so it's a tiny little town called Sutherland Springs, about 30 miles away from downtown San Antonio, about an hour from my house. And um, I didn't go at first when the shooting happened. So it's still the fifth largest mass shooting in the United States and 26 people were killed over 20 were injured. Um, and a lot of children were involved as well. So, um, pretty, and I mean, any mass shooting is like very intense to cover in any way, but that for sure. Um, and so I didn't go at first actually, because I was trying to finish the story about Rowan and I was said, I cannot immerse in that level of trauma of a mass shooting while I'm trying to, you know, finish Rowan's story, um, which was obvious, you know, like a very sad story in the end. And I had a really hard time finishing it. So I was like, okay, I can't finish it. And then, um, so, but going back, other, you know, journalists went to the town and it could have been, totally been me and I would have done the exact same thing if that was my assignment to go. But it was a very small town, like a blinking stoplight town of about 400 people. And so like hundreds of journalists come and they set up, you know, the tents and have their big crews. And um, and so that they kind of took over the town and the people, the survivors and family members of victims felt that they um, were you know, re-traumatized by, or like had another level of trauma from like the inundation of journalists in their community and how they couldn't, like, they felt like they couldn't even go to their home because there were, you know, journalists parked outside their homes. Um, and so hearing that made me have to, and like hearing it for the, I spent about two years with them, um, you know, documenting their recovery and rebuilding their church and, um, I had to really 
build that trust um, with them, even like the Express News, I was, you know, working for them at the time. And we had run this like horrific headline, horrific headline that made me gasp out loud. And so, of course, when I started going, I started going a month later um, and spending time with them. And they were very like they really did embrace me, but I had to answer for some of those things and I had to hear about it a lot. And it made me start thinking about how we cover um, traumatic events like that and what kind of conversations that I think we should be having about it. And if there's a way to, you know, inform the public and record history, but also really think about minimizing harm in situations where people are experiencing the worst moments of their lives. So I spent, you know, all that time with them, seeing journalists come in and out, seeing like, you know, book art, people working on books, people working on documentaries. And so that's when um, I'll tell one little, one little story if you're willing. So yeah, it's a light bulb, yes. <laughs> a light bulb moment. So um, I had been thinking about doing a Neiman fellowship for like 10 years, but I always had a, or I shouldn't say I think about doing it. I was thinking about applying for it and hopefully being able to do it someday. But, um, and then I was there, I'd been working on the story for close to a year. It was about, it was a, it's a few days before the year mark. So, which is a very intense time, you know, when someone has a mm-hmm. event in their life, like the year mark brings up a lot, the anniversaries yeah. with that bring up a lot. So I was um, spending the day with the wife of the church's pastor and their 14 year old daughter, Annabelle died in the shooting. They were not there. And so that day was her birthday. What would have been her 15th birthday. And there was a lot of other stuff going on that day. And she was like, of course, very emotional. And I was too. I, she was the person I would probably grown the closest to and spent the most time with. And I remember sitting on the floor of this modular building that was their church at the time, because they weren't meeting in the sanctuary where the shooting had happened and the other one was being built. And I just thought how much it, like what led me to this point where I was sitting on this floor, like, you know, holding my camera and able to, you know, be in the situation where I could photograph and try to tell their story in that way. And I just felt like maybe it's time to do something else with this. And maybe I can use some of what I've learned in a positive way. And so then I decided to, and with that whole experience of them, you know, hearing the impact that we journalists had on them. And so then I applied for the Neiman with that in mind, researching like how we can, you know, again, the intersection of journalism and trauma and how we can minimize harm um, and just how to, how do we, what is our role in people's lives when they're experiencing traumatic events? Mm -hmm. Um, And that can be something like very intimate to, you know, like, a boy, a 10 year old boy dying or, you know, all the different things that we are going to, you know, a shooting in a neighborhood. I mean, all the different ways that we, um, you know, cover traumatic events. So then I went there and I don't know if you want me to (laughs) go on. I don't know. I mean, all this is incredible. (laughs) And I think um, because what you're doing is important and unique. And uh, I know there's always discussions around, things like this, but not as pinpoint as the attention that you're giving it to where you're peeling back the layers um, into there's a lot of thought and uh, there's a lot of time invested to create something or develop something to help people, um, again, to not leave a negative footprint within a community. And at the same time, you know, it's because it's about it, the people you're there to tell stories about. It's also uh, to not, you know, potentially hurt people that come in the future to tell stories to where they're not going to be able to get, you know, tell them effectively or at all. Um, and, and that's why I like, I'm really excited to share this on here because whether it's for future students or alumni that hear this, um, what what you're putting together, I think, um, is going to be super important, you know, for the path forward uh, for the for the whole profession, one way or another. And uh, yeah, but I'd love to have you continue share, um, like where you're going with that, and um, 
yeah, what the what the end state of what you'd like that to be. Okay. That's <laughs> let me see, where do I start? Oh, uh, without this <laughs> really long. So um once I started kind of diving into the research um, and finding that there was a fair amount of actually research on journalism and trauma, which I didn't really have any idea about except the Dart Center. Are you familiar with the Dart Center? Um, I think we may have talked about it like briefly like a year ago. Um, but okay. Yeah, so the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, they have a fellowship. It's a week-long fellowship, and they are really our profession's greatest resource for covering, you know, traumatic events, for the impact that it has on us. They have, you know, cultivated, like, lists of resources and lists of academic research, and um, they have uh, a woman, uh, Dr. Alana Newman, who is you know, she's a psychologist. She's a professor at, um, I think it's Tulsa, the University of Tulsa. Sorry, this is terrible because she's actually on my dissertation committee. So I should know exactly <laughs> where she is, but, um, and I do, I just not at the moment, maybe edit this part out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, I don't want you to have edited. Yeah, too, 100%. But, um, so, um, but it was started by a psychiatrist, Dr. Frank Ockberg, and um, they have, and so, and another a journalist is the director, um, Bruce Shapiro, and so it's just like this incredible research resource for us. And I went there um, in 2017, and so started really learning about, um, you know, the different ways that we do again cover traumatic events, the impact on us, the impact that um, the neuroscience of trauma, which I still don't know a ton about, but um, really helped me understand a lot of like my own reactions and that I wasn't a bad journalist to have human emotions when I'm being a journalist, mm -hmm. dropping, that that's okay. Um, and so then I just decided that I was, then it just kind of started getting me interested in that then fast forward to the church shooting. And then I'm thinking, okay, there's more I can be doing with this. And then, so then did the Neiman came back for a year working during COVID. I will just skip that experience. That was not a great year um, covering, covering um, working during COVID and then went to the University of Missouri to start pursuing my PhD and um, with it and and hope to teach full-time at a university and then, but also really dive into research. And my research has been very focused on two things and that, um, you know, I went specifically and I'm hoping my dissertation will be on this about, to um, learn from the experiences of people who have tra experienced traumatic events and had their experiences with journalists. So, and my mm -hmm. focus is mass shootings. So that's what I'm working on now partially. Um, and then, but I'm also keep getting drawn back to the um, photojournal, to the journalist experience and especially the photojournalist experience because the photojournalists are, like, visual journalists are missing from a lot of academic literature. So like even all the books about journalism that I didn't yeah. even know existed, like mm, visual journalists are not in there. I mean, yeah. I will actually go to the index and look to see if photography is mentioned or visual journalists of any kind are mentioned. No, they're not. So, um, so of course, I'm drawn to like giving us more of a voice and mm -hmm. able to share our stories more, even through academic research. And so, one of the ones main ones that I've been working on is about um, the cumulative impact of covering mass shootings on Texas photojournalists specifically because they are, um, you know, we have a lot of mass shootings in Texas. And so people have now covered many of them. And so what is the impact on them? So I'm looking, I'm very interested in, of course, in both sides and, and there's plenty of research to be done. I don't know. So, if that's yeah, no, that's but. incredible. Um, and when you're done with this research, like what would you like done with it i guess you know <laughs> like what would you like uh you like it's done um like do you want it out like to the whole community um do you like what is your end state uh, of what you'd like to see come from all this hard work and research going into something again that is really important and incredible uh an incredible conversation to have 
Well, yeah, thank you for that. I'm glad that people see the value in it for sure. Um, and when I first started out, I thought I wanted to do like some sort of, you know, short documentary and to also have, you know, the, like the perspective of photographers and perspective of um, the people that are being photographed, whether it's in like news of breaking news or long-term stories. And I still hope to do that eventually. Um, but for the main, the most part, I want it to be in useful in our industry. I mm -hmm. mean, I, the academic research is like a whole other thing I will not get into that yeah. I don't even still understand. <laughs> really. So, but um, doing the research and then figuring out how to synthesize it and make it accessible and mm -hmm. useful educationally is really what I want to do. So I would love to do like in academic research, like call them, I think more monographs. So it's more like an extended, um, you know, research mm -hmm. paper in a way, but, um, you know, a book certainly is in my mind to do. Well, that's but really cool. Sure yeah. Exactly. Um, or maybe a couple different ones. So I don't know, I'm still getting the hang of it. And then, but I think that one of the biggest challenges for myself and other, you know, practitioners who, uh, go into academics mm -hmm. is figuring out the crossover. So how do I make this readable to, I mean, cause some of the academic research I read, I don't understand. Like, I don't understand these words, <laughs> I don't, mm -hmm. you know, like how, and not to say people won't necessarily understand it, but how do you turn it from academic research into something more practical that we can use? And so whether that's through the DART Center or the MPPA, just making, um, accessible you know reading about like what what we do as journalists we read about people's experiences right mm -hmm. and we write about people's experiences and we photograph their experiences and so I'm trying to do the same thing but with you know in another way and that we can use it somehow and have bigger conversations which I think are happening I mean certainly you know like in the last five years even there's been a huge trans or uh, what would the word be in terms of just talking about more like the mental health of journalists? And that's a huge area of research right now. Yeah. And one that has existed actually for a long time, but this will point to what I'm saying. Like, I'm still trying to figure out how the crossover, because there's a lot of research that I didn't even know existed. There are people having these conversations, yeah. but it's not trickling into the profession. So how mm -hmm. do we bring it into the profession that maybe, yeah. you know, editors are looking at it um, or, you know, reading about this. Okay. How do we do this? And it's not from my perspective. It's from the voices of, you know, the photojournalists or journal, yeah. you know, reporters or the people that we are photographing. And hopefully that will make some sense. Yeah, no, I agree. It does. It makes a lot of sense. And like, that's where I think a lot of our challenges for, uh, and things in life is to getting it, getting, a particular thing, like in this case, the information in the hands of the influencers, whether again, it's, you know, the editor or whether it's a professor or whether, you know, it's like the NPPA and you have this collective effort to wherever, like all these influencers are, are bought in and invested to where they feel it's important to have these conversations. And then like over time, you know, those that really adds up to where it becomes standardized, but it's only really going to happen. Like you're saying, um, if these influencers that have access to uh, these people uh, take the time and to get it out there. Cause uh, to me, it's interesting that like you're finding more and more of this, you know, information and knowledge uh, has already been attained up to a certain point, but the fact that no one knows it exists it almost makes it to where it's like, it's not even written. Um, and, and that's a shame, but I guess that's where I guess it's exciting for you to share that on here today. Cause I feel like this, you know, is an opportunity at least for the uh, Eddie Adams alumni community and for all the, everyone else outside of uh, the workshop that listened to this, that now they're going to be aware and maybe they'll go Google something, they'll go research something and, and ask some questions. So that's, super neat. And uh, I know really deep conversations um, and a little segue to uh, a little uh, lighter ones. And my last two for you, because I've had you for a little while and I don't want to hold you captive forever. Um, but the first one is, uh, can you share what the workshop uh, has meant to you? 
Yeah. I mean, what it means to me goes back to like my ride on the school bus to, or from New York to the, to Liberty, you know, to the days in and like the community building started on that bus for me. Learn, you know, I still keep in touch with some of those photographers, you know, the people that I met, not everyone's in photography now, not everyone's um, working for a publication all over the place, but we all, a lot of us still keep in touch and being able to have that community um, has just meant a tremendous amount to me. And I feel like I have this family and feel supported and feel like a, a family of people that love the thing that you love in a very similar way and to the extent mm -hmm. that you love it and being in that, um, you know, has been a tremendous experience ever since even, you know, when I was a student in 1998, I probably shouldn't date myself that much. No, <laughs> <laughs> that, no, 1998. Yeah. 1998. I went to 11. So um, yeah. And just, you know, the in same inspiration there that you were asking about people that inspired me. I mean, I still remember the very first night, the, you know, to those who have been there, they know this night and to those who are coming this fall, the Friday night in the, like, I still get chills, like thinking about the Friday mm -hmm. night at the barn, which is oh, yeah. <laughs> my, the, my favorite, the Friday night in the barn, the first night and mm -hmm. the final show, those are my favorite to see what the students all found in the community and how they photographed. I love that. Um, and so you know, seeing Eugene Richards speak. Wow. Yeah. This is before devices, before we had all these distractions, <laughs> right. before we could hear a pin drop in there. And it's just like, it just, I don't know. It just like builds your love for what we do and love for each other and a very like unique, magical way. Yeah, no, it's there was something about the place, like even like being a part of the, t the team that uh, that helps put it on. Um, it's there's still something magical about being there outside of the team that helps try to make the magical that magic happen for when all the students show up. And um, it's one of those unique places. And I'm sure like we all have a couple different places throughout our life that we get somewhere and it just feels special to us. And it's to me, uh, interesting and and compelling to where there's this one particular place for photographers that we can all feel the collectively the same way, um, and like and it happened again and again year after year to where uh, people are walking away feeling the same way uh, uh, is really cool, and it's something like you said to be able to share with one another and and really just make a bond for those who uh share a similar passion for you that yeah sometimes like we all life happens and our, our paths change from what we intend at the time but the connections that we make with those people and that special experience um really help define like a reason why the workshop is important to a lot of us and you know it's not the only reason but it's it's one of the many reasons um and so that's really cool thank you for sharing that mm -hmm. yeah and so but uh, for the last question that I have for you, um, I, I love hearing the response on this because they're never the same and there's no wrong answer. Um, and I know I've heard from some people like they get stressed now because I've heard other people's response. And so um, hopefully, you know, you're not stressed with this, but do you have a favorite photo? So I do. I don't know. I haven't listened to all of them, so I don't know if this is anyone else's. Well, favorite well photo, I mean, but, um, it's probably not too. <laughs> like, in terms of historically, it's a um, photo, um, an Alfred Eisenstadt, if I'm saying that right, um, puppet theater, you mm -hmm. know, the children at the puppet theater. Yeah, yeah. So I have always loved that photo. And in the Monroe Gallery, who I believe uh, represents Eddie Adams' work in Santa Fe, they ha had this one, it was a triptych. So it was like three of the frames. And I remember just very early on seeing that photograph and like, that's what we do. Like, just to like how, you know, that he turned around and it wasn't what was on the stage. It was how the kids were reacting. And all of them have these different expressions. Yeah. Especially in the triptych, you can really see the three different frames in a row 
of like how the emotions evolved and like you know you can imagine of course then I I don't even know what year it was but early 60s I think and just and in Paris um but yeah just how all their emotions evolve and just you know thinking about being there and photographing their excitement and it's a very positive photo too so that's I can think so that's one of my favorite photos I love that I'm definitely going to uh look that up and uh because I I definitely too like being able to sometimes take a photo and be able to like for me I think of uh shots like sports moments and then you some people you see like they're in bliss and other ones they're in tears right beside them because they might have been cheering for another team and like it's this moment of just capturing emotion and the storytelling to, to where it's not you know the main actors on the stage it's it's the the supporting cast around them to help create this moment and to make it why it is a moment um and uh which makes it so special and i yeah, I, I i really i connect with that and i'm excited to go look that up and and really and see what that looks like yeah, it's a very da- da- connected to David Sutherland too. Like okay. people, da- people that don't know David Sutherland is always like, mm. you know, stay with it. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> happening, stay there, keep photographing as this moment evolves. And so that's what that puppet, you know, the ch- children at the puppet theater photo does. It's like, I don't know, somehow very early on that photograph connected with me. And there's thousands of other photographs that I love that I could ramble on about, but that's the one I choose at this moment. (laughs) Well, perfect. Thank you for sharing that one. And uh, thank you for sharing your time today. Like I had a blast. Uh, I'm grateful uh, for you being able to cut some time out of your day and to share it with us and to share so much. I learned a bunch. Uh, I know we talked about some super important things that I'm excited to get out into the world. Um, But before I let you go, do you have any parting words that you'd like to share with anyone or are you good? Well, just thank you for having me. I am very honored to be included in this and anything with the Eddie Adams workshop um, that I love so dearly. And um, I would say congratulations to the incoming class and Mm -hmm. have a wonderful time in the fall and don't come with a ton of uh, pressure on yourself. Just (laughs) soak up every minute and love every second and it should be a great experience. So other than that, just keep, uh, (laughs) no, everyone just keep doing what they're doing. That is not a good answer. Please edit that out. So (laughs) (laughs) awesome. Well, no, I mean the part about the, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I know the last last part. part (laughs) So, well, and I will say one last thing, the paper, the research that I'm working on today is about where photojournalists are in the newsroom hierarchy. So that's what I'm going to go back and work on now. Awesome. Well, I will definitely keep tabs on that and reach out to see what that looks like in the next couple of weeks or months. Um, But again, thank you for making time today and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Bye. We'll stop recording.